Hello, and my name is Peter Rushmer, and I'm your host today of a Half Dozen Things podcast. A Half Dozen Things is a podcast for business owners and professionals just like you. Whether you're an underdog hungry for success or you're already smashing it but want to continue to level up, we're here each week for you to get insight and learning from the very best in the business. No fluff, no BS and no self-proclaimed gurus talking about how easy business or life is. Just real, frank and raw conversations. Uh, red light is rolling. Uh, welcome, Fred. Thank you for joining me on a half dozen things. How are you today? Yeah, good. Thanks, Pete. Good to uh, good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely brilliant to see you too. So I've run a, uh, a bit of an introduction to you for the listeners uh, prior to uh, us having the conversation, and uh, yeah, really, really buzzing to have you here. And actually, I'm going to tell the guys how we first met. So you ran uh, a consultative sales course. Was that the right title? A consultative sales course when I was at uh, Volvo. Pretty sure it was. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> and uh, introduced me to uh, the world of sales, and uh, and actually, to be fair, it was quite transformative. So hopefully, that is um, uh, a bit of a big up to uh, to your sales training skills, because actually, it was a really, really good experience. And um, being my first sales training se- uh, session, I uh, I was a little bit apprehensive about how it was going to be, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't it wasn't what I expected. So you dispelled the myth, Fred. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> but equally, you had nothing to compare it to. So <laughs> <laughs> True, but I have been on sales training since. <laughs> and I still refer back to, uh, I still refer back to your notes, even uh, Ada. I still remember Ada, uh, which is something that you, you covered. Um, yeah, so yeah, no, it's, uh, it's really good, really good. And oh, you've, got a new, you've got a new book coming out soon. That's right. Yeah. We're sort of launching in, in, in a month or so. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty, it's, it's, uh, it's creeping up on me. <laughs> We're not just about ready, but, uh, yeah, I certainly have. Yeah. Brilliant. So what, um, tell me a bit more about the book and, and sort of a bit more about what you do and then we'll get into your six areas cause we're going to be quite specific today about the six uh, or half dozen things um, because they're going to actually be segments from your, from your book. So if you could just give us a little bit of an intro on that um, and then, uh, and then we'll dig in and, and sort of go into a bit more depth on those six partnering skills. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as you alluded to there, the book is called selling through partnering skills. And, uh, you know, hopefully does pretty much what it says on the tin. It is a sales book. You know, I, I'm a commercial sales trainer. Um, but one of the things I'm very aware about is being very current and, and making sure that all the stuff that I'm doing is, is setting people up to do what they need to do in the best possible way. And if we look at sort of how sales has developed over time, we're at a point where sales is more collaborative than ever before. And so one of the things that, that I can do to help people operate in a way that's consistent with that. Um, and so, yeah, the consultative selling that you talked about, value-based selling, a lot of the good stuff that already exists is relevant. Yeah. But, but how can we just add this sort of extra sort of veneer to that or this sort of uh, refine the approach? For me, this is all about bringing partnering skills into play, which is why the book is all about selling through partnering skills. Got it. Okay, so for um, for the ignorant listener, um, could you just please explain what consultative selling is, um, and then a bit about value based selling as well? Because uh, I may have people listening who may not necessarily know what they are. Okay. Well, actually, if I step back even further, might might be easier um, because in the book I do sort of cover four nominally different ways of selling. They are all interconnected. And if you think on a sort of a a scale of value and complexity with value being the value that you bring to the customer and almost by definition, the value to yourself and the complexity is of how difficult the sale is. So how many people are involved, maybe what the solution actually ends up looking like at a more basic level, we have what I call classic selling and classic selling. It's all about ask before tell. I think if anybody's not doing that, they're not selling, in my opinion. They're, they're just doing something else completely, repping or something like that. But we need to ask before tell. But as we become, the sale becomes more valuable and, and more people involved and the complexity starts to increase, 
the way that people ask questions, the way that they help the customer to understand what their issues, their problems are, that's where we need to be more consultative. So that the type of questioning becomes a little bit more refined. So consultative question, some people will call this solution selling. I mean, it's very much the same thing. It's all about the quality of the questions that you ask so that you can really help people understand what their issues are, the impacts that they might have. And if we sort of continue to grow that, that can take us into the next level of sales, which is value-based selling. So really understanding what's the level of value we can bring to them before the sort of the, the, the top end of sales, if you like, which and I refer to as, as enterprise selling in the book. But equally, we could call that strategic selling. Far more people involved, more a team approach, big ticket type things, longer sales cycles. Um, so the, the partnering skills that I talk about will help anybody operating at any of those levels. As I say, it brings a refinement, it brings a veneer to the way in which they're doing what they need to do for their particular sale. And there's no wrong or right, really. Each person is going to be having to do what they need to do in their market. I'm getting, I'm getting quite a bit of scratching, like, like a scratching noise. I don't know if it's you or me, but I've just tried muting me to test it. I'll cut this out, by the way, edit it yeah. out. Um, okay. Do you know what that is? Have you got, have you got something? I might, I might have been drawing something. So I'll... <laughs> That's what it was. Sorry, okay. <laughs> hey, what I'll are you drawing? drawing? Show me. I'm, I'm drawing, I'm drawing what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving it in. I'm leaving it in as okay. an outtake. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, you've got to leave it in. Explain, though, that I'm a trainer and I yep. can't talk without drawing. <laughs> but you're lucky I that I I'll do it you... in the intro. When I record the intro, I'll just tell him, I'll go, there's a little bit of scratching at the beginning. Fred's drawing a picture for us. <laughs> <laughs> <Well>, myself. <laughs> Look, you're lucky I'm not stood up. Use my flip chart behind. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I know you love a flip chart. And to be fair, actually, I've incorporated... I incorporated your style in the training that I do. Obviously, I don't do sales training, but I actually incorporated your style with the flip chart and I tear stuff off and I blue tack it up on the wall and stuff for people to refer back to. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Very flattering, mate. Not happy with that. Pure, cred pure credibility <laughs> you, you, back to you, there. You, you can leave this in. Part of partnering is about being authentic. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we'll try and cut down on the scratching, people. Uh, or the drawing, is it, maybe? I'll swap pens. I'll swap pens. We're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you, 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 nice explanation of uh, value-based selling there and, and consultative-based selling. So, and partnering skills just sort of takes that, uh, sort of develops that a bit further then. Yeah, so, so partnering skills can be used, as I say, at all levels of those sales. To be fair, partnering skills can be used in lots and lots of different things. And I'm sure some of your listeners are probably in more of a leadership role or something. And I think, you know, well, where can I use this stuff? Or, or can I use this stuff? And, and absolutely you can. I've chosen to take it down the sales route because that's what I do. Um, but yeah, it, it very much, it just sort of brings a sales ethos. It sort of helps develop a mindset that's far more conducive to selling in this more collaborative, helpful way that we need to, to operate in um, to be successful these days. Perfect, perfect. Okay, cool. So, and as part of that, we've got sort of different areas of partnering skills and um, they are trust, creating a win-win orientation, uh, self-disclosure and feedback, comfort with interdependence, comfort with change and future orientation. So they're all very, very interesting and I'm looking forward to sort of hearing a bit more about them. Tell me a bit more about, about trust, particularly initially, Fred. Yeah, so if I, if I just step back one slightly, um, so, so if I refer to PQ, partnering skills, partnering intelligence, always I'm talking about the same thing. Um, and, and, and a way if people just want to sort of understand this, people are probably reasonably comfortable with the concept of IQ or intelligence quotient of you know, how clever somebody is, which only measures certain stuff. More recently, people have started to focus on EQ or emotional intelligence, which talks about understanding yours and, and others' feelings and how you can act, act on that. PQ is almost like the, the, the lesser known cousin, if you like. Um, but, you know, isn't just a isn't just a sort of fanciful concept I had. It's something that was very much researched and developed by a guy called Steve Dent uh, back in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, um, working with organizations that were partnering together and looking at, you know, what were the characteristics of the people involved? Because 
organizations don't partner people do what what were those characteristics that people had to be able to be successful at partnering and as you say when you when you list those things so the ability to trust that win-win focus the comfort with interdependence self-disclosure and feedback comfort with change in a future orientation any salesperson so whether you're a partner manager distributor manager or a direct salesperson i think they should be all over it yeah and you know go back to your question so i'm a trainer i don't always ask the question directly do i um, <laughs> about trust i mean trust is such an important element of professional of professional selling it's, 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 it's an important element of any relationship and so that's why that's the one that i when working with this stuff will tend to talk about first it, it really is the foundation if you like all the other elements will will, will help with that but and, and, and equally stem from it yeah definitely so trust trust such an important part of what we do and our, the, the, our conversation around partnering intelligence and pq is quite timely because I've just started to rebrand rebrand the business. Uh, we we've sort of evolved a little bit over time, and we now I've now decided to call us flagship partners, and and that is actually about the approach of of partnering because I think part of that consultative sales process that hinged with how I feel about what great customer service looks like because I think selling is is part of customer service, and I think that delivering a great service then enables you to be able to sell and build relationships over time as well and create partnerships with people. And one of the things that I've learned sort of in, in my time since, since I left corporate work and, and moved into being self-employed is that actually partnerships are so important, not just in sort of in my client base, but also with the other businesses around me and the way that we support each other and pass referrals as well. And, and, ultimately as you say all of that all of that hinges on their trust in me to be able to do a good job for them but you know whether it's directly to a client or whether it's indirectly through someone that's referred me in to support them um trust trust is such a massive element of that it, it really is you know and it, it, it's the foundation for all communication and so that that's where the healthy productive relationships will come from um, so that there's, if, if you're, you're in the process of rebranding, nice little, nice little bit of homework for you. Here, you can't take the trainer out of me. I can't help myself. Um, have a look at the trust equation. Yeah, trust use this equation. to just gauge how good you are at this trust thing. Because everyone okay. talks about it. Everyone says it. But yeah. let's actually put our money where our mouth is and start to understand what it is. Okay. So okay. Again, I'm going to Google was, that. I'm going to Google well, that in the background whilst you're telling me about win-win orientation. Well, no, I'll tell you about the trust equation. I can go oh, okay, through it pretty fine. quickly, you know. Okay, um, you're going to get the flip chart out. You're going to get the flip I'm, chart out. I could get the flip chart out, but it'll probably make too much noise. And if the scratching was bad, you don't want to hear my chair and, and the rest. But uh, the trust, if you imagine T equals C plus R plus I divided by S love an equation but i don't so, understand I what that might. is <laughs> right so trust is about your credibility plus your reliability plus your intimacy divided by your self-orientation so what we're saying here is that the credibility element is that whether you know your stuff or not that's going to be a big part of trust. So if I'm thinking about working with you, I'm going to be thinking, well, does, does Pete actually know his stuff here? Or is he just kind of full of hot air? No, the guy's an expert. That's fine. Yeah. But that could be fine. You could know all this stuff. But if you don't have the R for reliability, which if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Again, that's going to have an adverse effect on the trust that, that, that we, can, we can start to build. The intimacy element is about whether I think I could give you valuable information and whether you are likely to sort of use that well or you know whether I can actually <laughs> in many ways know that you're going to care about that. So that's the C, the R and the I. And you say, well, yeah, you know, okay, that's, that's good. I'm great on all those things. I'm credible. I know my stuff. I'm reliable. Your information is safe with me. That's probably the easiest way to describe that. Underneath all that, though, is the S of self-orientation. 
because you might be fantastic on those. But if ultimately you're doing it with only your best interests in heart, then that isn't as valuable as if you're saying, no, I do these things because I do genuinely care about others. And I, I want to do this stuff because I do want to work properly with them rather than actually that'll be a good stuff for me if I give that impression. Fantastic. It's, it's, it's a nice little thing just to come back as a bit of a sense check. And it's what I will often do with salespeople. But again, it, it acts for leaders, business owners, whatever, as to uh, do we actually stack up well on those elements? Yeah, 100%. Can be can be quite a tough little tester, actually. But, you know, it's certainly yeah. something that... Uh, you, could be quite, you could be quite savage on yourself, really, because I like to believe I know my stuff from a cred- credibility point of view. I believe that I am reliable if I say I'm going to be somewhere, somewhere I will be. But actually, when it comes to um, what was what was the third one? The uh, credibility, In, reliability, intimacy, intimacy. So, so that was the one I safe. I struggled with. So that so when you said that, that resonated with me actually because I often I, I don't know if it's my personality type or what have you, but often I do think that I often struggle to I suppose peel back the onion or what have you. One mm-hmm. of the things is is that. I do keep quite a professional relationship with people and actually different people will have different needs as far as that's concerned, won't they? Yeah. And again, if you're sensitive to other people, that that's kind of quite important from that point of view that, yeah, it's, it's not all about being loving and you've got to absolutely sort of be so, so close to everyone. It's more about the safety. It's more about the safety of information. Yeah. You know, am I, am I comfortable giving you info that you, that you got need you. really to build that overall trust? Yeah. Well, I think you know, oh, you know what? I don't know what Pete's going to do with that. It's a bit yeah. sensitive. And Got it so it's about creating, creating that. I'm talking environment. about it all on his next, his next podcast, <laughs> and it was actually quite private stuff. So yeah, that, that's what we mean by that. But with all, oh, yeah. I love that. And then, so this, this was um, when you do Google it, you'll find it was actually by a guy called David Meister, okay. and then some colleagues, Charles Green and, and Robert Galford. Um, Harvard Business School people. So you know, it's, it's <laughs> again pr- pretty good little yeah. tool that you know we can be very self-reflective with and think okay yeah. well i need to do something about it yeah brilliant okay and then um and then finally obviously the the one for all sales people is you know our self-oriented are we or do we actually care and that that obviously builds trust is when we do care and demonstrate that we can actually and, and do care about the outcome that other people have absolutely yeah and there's nothing wrong with wanting to do something for yourself that's fine but have you got others' intentions, other best sort of interests at heart as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, which which leads us really nicely into a win-win orientation, right? It, it, it does. I mean, all this stuff's connected, you know. But the, the trust is that foundation piece. Mm-hmm. So the win-win orientation, you know, world of sales, um, we'll often talk about mutual benefit. Yep, absolutely. You know, are both parties looking at getting something out of this? Yeah, is there some reason for us to do that? And, that, and that's that's a big part of it. But what what partnering skills is quite interesting with as well is it looks at how we deal with conflict. Because even with the best intent, and we both try to work this together, there might be a time that we disagree on something. Oh, I think we do it this way. You might think we do it that way. We've got to get over that. How do we deal with that? Yes, we've got to keep that end goal in mind. This is why we're in it together. But do we just argue? Does the person who's in the most powerful position get their way? Or do we look at it like adults and really sort of try to solve that problem and come out of those discussions, potentially stronger for it? Because conflict resolutions actually can be quite a useful thing. So it's a win-win orientation and sort of having that, having that focus, but the way in which we want to go about that and, and, and hold those discussions, again, it's another, it's another key element, which okay, I'm using it for sales. It will cut across so many different areas of business. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, that, that that resonated with me when you said about sort of the conflict element of sales because potentially there there will be a conflict element and um one of the things that i remember us discussing was about handling objections and and how important that is to be able to handle objections skillfully um are you able to just for i'll give you a moment to have a little drink um yeah. but could you just explain sort of the process for handling objections it's sort of at quite a high level um that we that we discuss well, first is don't call it an objection. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me with my bad terminology. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, no, I'm not messing. It's a serious point. Um, in the, the psychology of calling it an objection isn't helpful. 
because yeah. what you're saying to yourself is the customer's pushing everything I've got to say back at me. Whereas actually, if you start to label that as a concern, yeah, yeah or, or something that they might be just missing a bit of interest, uh, sorry, not interest, missing a bit of information around, that's a far easier way to be able to deal with that. So yeah. the psychology of objection handling is really important. They're mm -hmm. not just dissing you completely. It's something that I didn't quite get it. Yeah. Or mm, I'm not quite sure about that. Mm -hmm. Start playing that tape in your head and that starts to become easier in the way that you can then start to handle it. And, and, and kind of another sort of the phrases we use is handle concern with concern. Yeah. So it's their concern, but I've actually got to be concerned with the fact that you didn't quite get that. Well, actually, that's probably my fault. I've not explained something well. I've missed something out of the proposal. I didn't really help you understand the issues properly that we're trying to deal with. And so rather than argue and go into an arm wrestle and say, yes, but Peter, yeah. well, yes, but you're going to get defensive, whether you're right or wrong, which we're going to end up kind of sparring on that. It's using some kind of language pattern that we can just cushion what the response is. So I, I can't give what people, what the response is, but I can tell them how they say it. So the first thing is to just keep calm. You know, they're not pushing back on you completely. They just probably didn't get something. Mm -hmm. Listen to what they actually said, because more often than not, we will kind of hear something, think, oh, I know where they're going with this. The people always say this. Actually, you might have said something different. And I need to hear what you've said to acknowledge what you've said. So I appreciate what you're saying. I understand why that's a concern. I recognize that that's something that's important to you. I can see why that will be something. Well, I accept that I probably should have. You're doing something just to cushion what it is that you're going to say to somebody. So with that cushion, kind of showing empathy to you, if you like, you're going to be far more willing now and far more relaxed for when I do come back and start to give you the response. So I'm going to say that. I'm going to cushion. I'm going to let that sink in. You go, oh, it's interesting. I thought you'd argue back with me as a salesperson. Okay, he's taking me seriously. So what I should have told you was, or what I, the extra information I probably should share, I can then go in and give the answer. Yeah, exactly. So just getting the mindset right, and then just your language patterns to make sure that you are still in that discussion to be able to to do your job properly, if you want to, if you want to put it that way. The lang language is so important, isn't it? So yeah, important. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad you uh, picked me up on my use of objection and not concern. I'll make sure I use concern in future. It's much better, much better choice of words. Good. There you go. See, action point. Get it written down. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. We're not in the trading room anymore. Well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. That's the whole point. Hey, come on. I still write proposals. I still write proposals. Well, I don't even know what the other terminology was for proposals that we shouldn't I'm, use. What is it? I'm not going to tell you. you should oh, use quite. It. That's yeah, it. There, yeah. we, there we, uh, I think I might. I, I do tend to have a soapbox around that area. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, soapbox that. moment. Come on, Fred. Let's what have, have you it. done? What have you done to poor listeners? Tell I've got Fred forward. out the box. <laughs> skip forward two minutes. No, it's the difference between a quote and a proposal. You know, so quote, well, there you go, that's your price. Okay, well, it's not really telling me why I should buy. It's not giving me the reasons. It's not showing that you understood me. It's not kind of giving me all the elements as to why I should invest this amount of money with you. You just give me a number. And guess what? If you're the more expensive than anybody else, I'll go and look for somebody cheaper. And then you'll tell me, yeah, but it's not the same. Well, you didn't tell me that. So no, I'm, not, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. But, okay, fine. But genuinely, <laughs> genuinely. What, a new genre of podcast called it Soapbox. <laughs> one, uh, one of my, um, one, one, uh, oh, a service we offer, Driver CPC. One of the first things that people will ask, particularly drivers, is how much, mate? How much for your Driver CPC? And I'm like, if that's your only determining factor on what's going to make a purchasing decision for you, we're not the right training centre for you. Brilliant. Sometimes, sometimes I have the balls to say that. If we're having a bad month, sometimes I don't know. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got a special offer on this month, mate. <laughs> How, that's very honest. No, very honest. <laughs> but, but if you're in the discipline of normally thinking, hang on a minute, just because you're talking to me, is it really an opportunity? Because if we're going down that route, it's not going to be me because you're not seeing all the added value of the stuff that we offer. So again, I'm, you know, we had a bit of a chat a bit about it, didn't we, as to how you're offering stuff and what other people are offering. And, you know, it's it, it's not the same. You, you can't compare apples and apples. It's apples and pears. It's apples and grapefruits, apples and whatever. Yeah. But you've got to explain that back. And certainly as we see more and more people getting involved in a decision, Mm. which is only going to increase in the current climate. I mean, it's increasing anyway. 
the person you talk to probably actually isn't going to say yay or nay. They're going to use that information to go to somebody else. And we've got to give them that stuff to be able to pass that on to, to show that we are different. And actually there's the value. And that's why I want to spend a bit more because I'm going to get a load more. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's quite hard when some people are, are very commoditized around, around what we do, and particularly in the sector that I operate in, in transport, for example, it's always, pounds and pence per mile and um yeah. and, and 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 those challenges but one of the things that i hark on about actually sort of go, goes back to that that value-based approach which is where do you differentiate yourself where are you differentiating yourself from your competitors and um, how can you squeeze your margin a little bit more because of the quality you offer and and the element of partnering that you offer as well and the reliability those, those elements of reliability the credibility of delivering a fantastic job Absolutely. And, you know, God, I'm just realizing now, <laughs> I don't know if it's because you've made me very aware of so a lot of the, the phrases that I use, but a, another one, and I think this is down to a colleague, actually, that I heard once. And I will recycle stuff with, you know, if I think it's good. Um, being different isn't a differentiator. Yeah. So you might say, look, we do all this stuff differently. And if I'm not, like, I don't care, mate. <laughs> it makes no difference to me. That isn't. So you've got to really pick the stuff that, yes, it's different and somebody cares. That will then become your differentiator. Just say, yeah, but we all we do all our training wearing red jackets. Okay, that's different, but I don't care if you do it red, blue, green or pink. You know, it's not yeah. a big deal. Definitely. Um, it's, it's got to matter and have impact. It's got to matter. Of course it does. Then yeah. it becomes your differentiator. So that's what you've got to get an understanding, understanding target market, working out how can I add that stuff in to make it attractive but then not completely bust my own cost base. <laughs> Look at it. Fred bringing the value today. Brilliant. Perfect. Right. Mate. So Quite talk to me time. a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Self-disclosure and impact, which is uh, the third area of, uh, of PQ. Or, or self-disclosure and feedback. Self-disclosure and feedback. So th this, this is an important part in the, to be, to be, to be a good partner, you've, you've got to, understand we talked about this kind of you know what the other party wants but equally they got to understand what you want as well so this whole part of self-disclosure and feedback it's about constantly exchanging what we're thinking what we're feeling about how that relationship is now this is quite a big one for again let me put my sales trainer hat on it's a big one for salespeople because quite often they'll go and they'll get feedback from the customer yeah, how are we doing? Let's have a review meeting. Tell us what we can do better. All that good stuff, which again, I've got no problem with, you know, positively encourage. But sometimes they won't feel confident enough to say, well, actually, this is what we need from you. This is a self disclosure but you know, what you're doing isn't right. You know, it's not helping us to help you. It isn't sort of fair in the way the relationship had been originally set up. But they'll sit and absorb it all. And what we're saying, you know, for a, for a partnership, and you know, this stuff goes way beyond sales and business even, you know, you've got to have those honest, open discussions as to, you know, I'm, I'm not getting it here sort of thing. I, I, you know, you need to know that this isn't right for me at the moment because if I don't and if that festers, then potentially that's where the, the whole thing's going to fall down. That's quite, you know, go back to sales, where that's quite an eye opener for sales people saying, well, we go back to our customers. So they're not behaving right. Potentially, yes, because we've talked about setting up this sort of collaborative, this in it together, this win-win approach. But if you know, it takes two to tango, if you like. So we've we've got to make sure we we keep that dialogue going. Hundred percent. One of, one of the things that resonates with me in this section from from actually the the training we had and when I was going on and selling selling vehicles, um, I um, I remember you saying it was around look for when people use language which is picturing them in the situation when they're purchased so i i actually got very excited one time in fact i didn't a year i ended up making a sale and um it was uh someone said when when i receive the vehicle and i'm driving it or something like that or when i'm driving it and it was the physical they were thinking about actually driving it i was like yeah i'm there yeah. fred told me this had happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's buying signals what, what 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 you were doing there is you know they probably weren't but well, they weren't consciously doing it i guess but they were kind of giving you that feedback that yeah you're hitting the right notes here yeah um so yeah sometimes 
this, this self-exclusion feedback piece can be a very deliberate, conscious and managed way of working. So, you know, let's set up regular review meetings where we properly discuss about what value are we giving you? What are we getting, et cetera, et cetera. Or it's those more subtle bits where, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. And this is what the guy is saying to me in the, yeah, he's giving me that feedback that, yeah, he, he likes what I'm saying here. But in that case, we, we call that buying signal. <laughs> yeah, got you. Got you. I'm going to be aware of it, be, be tuned into that. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's almost like uh, taking a bit more of a key account manager role um, rather than, than just a, a sort of a, a sales role. It's sort of an ongoing an ongoing process where you have review meetings to sit down regularly to, to discuss how things are going from a partnership point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And for another so many soapbox, I didn't really, like, I didn't know I got so many soapboxes, but another one. Maybe I'll just is, trigger you, Fred. It's fine. It could be that. Have you, have you been bringing around all the people I've worked with recently? So what, what stuff does he get all excited about? You know, loads. <laughs> no. So with this and in some industries more than others, you know, I do quite a lot in the IT sector, uh, but equally, if you know, again, vehicles where you talk about sort of contract management and the rest of it, lots of people have QBRs, quarterly business reviews. Um, are there a waste of time? <laughs> is what I say. Okay. And everyone looks at me, a bit like you looked at me then, going, what, eh? How can that be? Well, so because what you'll probably do in your QBR is go in and say, look, here's all the SLAs and look at how we performed against them. We said that we'd fix this 98% on time. We did 98.5. And you wait for me to go, oh, that's fantastic, Peter. That's brilliant. <laughs> did what you said you were going to do. It doesn't, there's no value for it. I'm not saying you don't do it. I'm not saying you don't share the information. But there's far better use for our time. It's say, look, here's a bunch of stats. Here's some stuff. I'll send them to you. Let's have a look at it. You know, I've traffic like them. They're all green. Done a good job. But I want to use this time to really think about the value what we are taking from this relationship, both of us. Yeah. Let's start with you, Fred. How do you feel you're getting value from us? What could we do in better? Where could we build that more? But equally, I am going to say stuff back to you as well, as yeah. where I think you we need to operate. That is a far more grown up and sort of more valuable meeting than just going through a bunch of facts and figures. So yeah, okay. facts and figures have their place, but so I just say to you, look, just swap it. QBR to QVR, quarterly value review. Let's look at this and we deliberately sit down and say, how much value is this relationship bringing and where can we do more? Yeah. And you know, what, what I'll also say with sales teams is these things should be positioned as very important. So indicate that you're taking senior people from your side in. As in this is how important we take it. We've got the sales director. They want to sit on it. They want to hear that, you know, what we're doing and, is there any stuff that we need to do to make it better? And they want to hear it so they can make the decision fast to do that. You know, so again, that's more a corporate thing, you know, business managers, business owners, they can very much become part of this. Yeah. Or, you know, that's as you or I might do position. You now this is what we'll do. You know, when part of the projects we're involved with, we will sit down and we'll have these discussions. It's not a sales discussion necessarily. That's probably better if it's not. It's focusing in on value of the relationship. It's just going yeah. a different, different way altogether. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's sort of uh, moving from a task focused approach to an outcome focused approach. What is what 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 is actually happening in reality? Perfect. Okay, which which I suppose leads us nicely on to uh, future orientation. Oh, it's like somebody thought this through, isn't it? Isn't it right? <laughs> no, it wasn't no, it me, by the way. If anyone's listening, thinking, "Oh, Pete's organised this well," this wasn't me. Fred, it wasn't me. Fred has Fred done very well here. <laughs> I saw it saw these elements could see what sense they make um i think originally steve Dent, who who really was the sort of guy who did so much research into this presents in slightly different order for me it makes sense in the story that we're kind of telling here to move along like this Perfect, yeah. so if that's where we, we you know we're, we're thinking about where we can build value well okay where are we going with this yeah you know, how are we going to do stuff around that um and a lot of this part is to do with decision making and be really kind of conscious, if you like, and deliberate about how those decisions are made and almost like check ourselves on whether we're making decisions based in sort of past or are we honestly looking at the future? Oh, well, that stuff won't work. Well, why? Well, it didn't beforehand. Yeah, but time is different now. I mean, this is a massive one for the current environment, isn't it? <laughs> you know, a lot of the past sort of things were okay they're almost kind of irrelevant now um 
not only relevant is probably the wrong word but really thinking about we can spend so much time and effort focusing and dwelling on all the stuff that's gone before but really wouldn't we be better thinking this is where we want to be this is what we're aspiring to this is the goal this is the vision how can we then make sure all the things that we're doing are leading towards that so visions and future scoping and thinking like that is it's such an important part yeah 100%, um, 100%. starting with the end in mind yeah absolutely yeah i mean again the stuff isn't massively new stephen covey beginning with the end in mind you know think that's where we want to be and then we can we can work this stuff back um and so again it's it's another thing that we can get salespeople thinking about as to how can they how can they bring value to the customer not just in not just in the product the service the stuff they're selling but in the way they help the customer think mm. i mean yeah. now we're really talking sort of very sophisticated way of selling mm-hmm. where it's taking the conversation it's taking the focus it's getting people thinking a certain way because actually that's where the value is going to be yeah. yes it's nice that actually our products and the stuff that we're involved with will help you with that but really it's kind of whoa this is great having conversations with this guy because whenever he comes in here he really gets us fixed on where we can go with stuff yeah um, so it, yeah again it's another important part you know, of the partnering skills that we can see what's going to happen in the future and, and kind of make make decisions based better around that you know what the needs are going to be the wants to achieve that than well, this is the way we always did it type thing. Yeah, got you. There's quite a consultative approach there, isn't there, around going in and saying, this is this is what your future reality could be like. Um, and uh, I can help you, you know, I can help you achieve that. It was um, it was interesting for me this week, actually. I shan't, uh, based on the equation earlier, and one of them being the safety and people trusting me, I'm not going to say who it is, right? <laughs> good call mate good i'm gonna be call. very very careful and i'm really going to consider that actually because you make a fair point when you've got it, it's very easy when you record a podcast um and and we're in this situation where we we feel like we're just having a conversation and i learned it very early on when i was recording um when i was recording the podcast is you can fall into that trap of it's just us having a conversation without realizing that it's going out on the on on the big domain and it's out there and it's public and I don't think, you know, as far as I'm aware, I won't have upset anyone I know by, by some of the things I've said. But I have listened back and gone, I got very close there, got very close. And I can sort of feel the comfort. The person knows, if they listen, they know that it's them I'm talking about, but no one else will know. And hopefully that'll be okay. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because actually, I'm comfortable with that, but maybe actually are they. So it that's resonated. And because it's something I'd already been thinking about. But anyway, by the by. The by uh, You're just trying to get us all to listen to the whole back catalogue. Absolutely. Very, yeah, clever, you got... <laughs> very clever indeed. <laughs> you know what? I what like great, it. What a great shout. Yeah. It, <laughs> go, go back and listen Listen to my errors. <laughs> listen to me shopping people in for their previous misconduct. Uh, yeah, no. So um, a company I've been working with uh, recently uh, with some mental health training. I've been working with several, so no one's going to know who it is. Um, but they had a sales team and I was absolutely shocked actually. And I was like, we were talking about mental health and the impact of goals and targets, um, and particularly in a time like this when we've got a particular challenge. And they're like, well, we don't really have any. And I was like, what? Say what? <laughs> I was absolutely shocked. <laughs> so you, you guys are absolutely fine. You've got no men- you're not going to have any mental health issues because you've got no targets to hit. It's like, okay, do you not even set yourself personal outcomes? No, no, not really. Dysfunctional. Mm, doesn't not having something to aim at leave them a little bit kind of listless and without focus and no purpose and disengaged? And I'd have thought, but hey, Adam, that's not right. Hey, what do we know, right? <laughs> what do we know? Right, so maybe we need to change them. Maybe we need to go in and change them. And we'll talk about comfort with change, Fred as our next area <laughs> yeah no again and, and it all it, it does all it does all fit in you know so this is where we want to be in the future this is what's going to happen this is how we're going to work together oh well that's not like it was no <laughs> because we have a future orientation ah so we're going to have to do stuff differently yes you know and you know certainly i mean again the, the timing of this conversation you know the comfort with change thing people are becoming a little more comfortable with the environment we're operating in but you know it's there are still people that that are resisting 
you know, no, it's not happening. It's not real. Not not a real thing. COVID doesn't exist. Yeah, everything's going to be okay. Or it's just a sort of flash in the pan and we're back to the old normal, that kind of thing. That's what I call a resistor. Um, other people will say, yeah, I, I can see that I need to adapt to this. We're going to have to start to do things differently. And again, that's, you know, it's a thinking style and something that if we recognize that that's what someone's style is, we can work with them in a certain way. And some people initiate it. Yeah, some people love change. Some people are like, oh, this is a glass half full. <laughs> this is, I don't think anyone would say COVID's brilliant, but, um, but you know, the, the need to change is fantastic because it gives us an opportunity. So it's just thinking change in general, you know, and they jump on it. And then sometimes I actually need to hold these guys back a little bit because they go charging off into the future. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's thinking that, you know, change is constant anyway, despite, you know, we'll have other big things which impact massively. So we just need to think about, you know, how can we manage that? How can we get the balance right? How can we work with people? And again, let me come back into my world of sales. How can we work with customers where potentially they are a bit more resistant or, you know, need some help with, with adapting? which is going to be different to the guys who are like, oh yeah, we love this stuff. Let's you know, fly, off, fly off into the future. So again, it's just understanding. And, and a lot of this stuff is about that conscious competence that we will have spoken about, I'm sure, on, um, <laughs> on the training back in the day as to what am I like at this? What's my own way of, of adapting or, or, or dealing with change? Mm. And so then, you know, am I in a decent position to be able to help other people with this? Yeah, definitely. And um, one, one thing, one thing, when I looked at this, I wanted to to, to try and sort of discuss a bit, bit deeper because this this could be, or, or when I learned it, certainly when when I got shown it, it was life changing for me. And hopefully, we can give people that eureka moment as well. But little reality check: not everyone thinks and behaves the way you do, and don't they don't make decisions the way you do. Um, and that was a massive game changer for me when I realised that that you know people don't think the same way as i do they don't make decisions the same way and sometimes it's our job to have be comfortable to make that change to support them to reach the right decision by using different strategies to to support that decision making yeah, dead right you know when when people do get that it is a eureka moment it's a big big moment and there's lots of different ways in which you know, we can help people do that by understanding personality styles and profiles, thinking about, you know, change style, resistor adapter, um, or initiator. Um, there's, again, there's just lots of things that people have a different map of the world. They see stuff differently. They think differently. And like you said, you can, you can do a couple of things here. If they're looking at the world from one side and you're looking at it from another, you can go and you can try and drag them around yep. to your side. That's hard work. Mm -hmm. yeah because people won't want to do that however it's far easier if you sort of walk around and start looking from their side and then work in that way it just it just makes far more sense and if that means that yeah you're going to change your style a little bit you're going to um communicate in a way which just sits better with them that they feel more comfortable with it takes into account that way of thinking mm -hmm. life becomes so much easier it, it is it's a big big eureka big big aha moment for folk yeah, yeah big time. which is why you know we we will often try and include that kind of thinking using whichever model um models to to open up people's minds and to become more you know i've said it before consciously competent in it yeah absolutely and i think i think that's sort of I, I, be, I believe that's in a nutshell in a in the most simplest form that's that's almost partnering as it is because I, I think of that from a leadership point of view with teams of people um and 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 understanding things from their point of view and that they don't think the same way as you they're in the position they're in and see things from their viewpoint and you need to get under that and it's the same from a selling point of view as well but it, in both senses uh sort of getting getting really comfortable with adapting that style is it's so so important and sometimes you know particularly i feel a little bit apprehensive occasionally because i know you know i'll recognize that in other people and i know that i'm going to find it challenging but actually what i have to tell myself is actually i'm in a fortunate position because i can preempt it because i because i'm a little bit or had some enlightenment to that i know it's going to be a bit challenging for me i know that someone's particularly data driven for example i've registered that i know it's going to be tough because i'm not uh, and I need to prepare the facts and figures and I need to be willing to go really in depth to try and make a decision or, or determine a decision with somebody. Uh, but actually, I, I keep telling myself, OK, I'm not so strong at that. But actually, 
I've got the opportunity and I've recognised that that's what I need to do. It is. Behavioural flexibility it, it, It's such a key thing of helping you get to the outcomes you want. You know, it might not be your preferred route. Well, yeah, okay, I'm big enough, I'm good enough to be able to change that. And yeah. like I say, you know, I'm not a very data-driven person, but if that's what somebody needs, okay, I can, I can flex it yeah. and do it that way. I wouldn't prefer to, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's the right thing to do at that time. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't mean that sometimes we shouldn't challenge people. You know, yes. And that, that, that's you know, kind of quite say, reasonably current. It's been around for a little bit, the challenger sale, where mm-hmm. saying, actually, no, we're going to have to have a difficult conversation here. We're going to have to have something where I am going to challenge some of your thinking. Yeah, I am going to point out some things, but I'm doing it for your own benefit. Mm. But I'm comfortable enough to do that. And hopefully you recognize that I am doing it with the right intent. But, you know, it's going to be a tough thing because you're going to start to reflect on things that potentially you could be doing better here. Yeah, it's correct. kind of that, that consultative selling and taking it up, taking it up a level. So flex, yes, but not always bend. Sometimes it's no, I am, I am going to push back on this, but deliberately because I'm going to try to open your eyes. Yeah, absolutely. So Take, it, taking yeah, a measured approach with it, a, a very measured is, strategic approach. It, it is, and it's just it's just making that pick. It's being able to flick between what's the best thing for me to do. So do I just roll with it and go that way? Because actually it doesn't matter. We're going to get to where we need to be. Or actually I am going to challenge. I'm going to push back deliberately because I think it's the best thing for this person at this time. So, And, and they will thank me for it later. They might not enjoy the conversation as such, but they'll be they'll, they'll be good with it ultimately. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, sometimes they're the most powerful as well, aren't they? You know, when when you really when you're really stretching and and being stretched, um, you know, they're they're often the ones that are, that, that resonate the longest. Um, okay, so finally, comfort with interdependence. Explain that a little yeah. bit more, please, Fred. Yeah. Well, again, you think about it, it's it, it's collaboration. You know, and, and I think this is for salespeople is quite a biggie because they're often quite independent operators. Um, well, they think they are, they're actually usually part of a large organization who wouldn't want them to think as such. Um, <laughs> but what we're saying is that if we're taking this, this partnering stuff seriously, you know, we've got these, this, this future orientation towards shared goals, um, win-win outcome. A lot of my success, a lot of what I want is going to be dependent on you you doing the stuff that you say and, and me giving you some of that control. I can't do everything myself. You know, that, that's the whole kind of definition, if you like, um, that it's not just all down to me or all down to you. It's the fact that we're coming together to do that. So I've got to be comfortable that, you know, some of my success or my outcomes are going to be based on you doing the thing that, that, that you say, if you like, or your organization or your department or whichever way you want to look at that. And it, it's just something that, we've got to live with we're not yeah, absolutely. kind of in this for ourselves yeah definitely and and you know taking that sort of one step further into sort of my experience with collaboration and um since i've become a business owner and working working with other companies is that that has that has brought me so much uh partnering uh or business through partnering than um than than anything else that i've gone out and won or cold cold called or or anything like that because the beauty of the collaboration is that anything is sort of pre pre pre-warmed so to speak it's already you know you're already in a position to be able to take take some action because that the the trust element got sort of going full circle back to trust the trust (laughs) element You love that I picked that up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for the trust element, it, it's already there, isn't it? You know, it's already there. Could you see what I'd just written? <laughs> no. Well. I'd, I'd literally written trust. Yeah, it does come back because to be properly interdependent, I'm going to have to trust you to do stuff. And, and, and your example is, is a brilliant one. You know, it could be the you know, simplistic terms. Okay, I've got some of my clients, people I work with, a bit possessive, but whatever but they need the training that you're going to do. I've got to trust you to be able to do that. You will become interdependent on delivering this, this success for this, this other party, you know? So yeah, it, it does come back to trust. You know, trust underpins all of them. Trust absolutely underpins all, which is why we, we, we talked about it first, why I will always talk about that one first. Mm-hmm. And so use the trust equation and sometimes break it down into, into other ways to really get people to think about, are they trustable? Hmm which was a deliberate word. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't say trustworthy, trustable, A-B-L-E, as in, can you trust people? Can people put trust in you? Yeah. Yes. So 
and that's why I sort of have a bit of a bit of a play with the, the English language on that. Absolutely. And listeners will have to listen to the full back catalogue to find out if I'm trustworthy or not. <laughs> <laughs> I've started, I've created a monster here. Gonna... You absolutely have. A hundred percent. I love it. I love it. I'm just going to drop, people... drop a little truth bomb every now and again. <laughs> Most people plug future shows, but you know, whatever. You keep your past orientation, Peter, and forget that we Five minutes ago, we're talking about looking towards the future being the way forward. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, whilst we talk about the future, whilst we talk about the future, talk to us a bit more about how to find you, how people can link up and obviously give the book a plug because that's coming in the future. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, well, yeah, people can find me on LinkedIn. That's a very popular, popular platform. Fred Copestake. I think there is only one of me. Um, it's, it's a bit of a weird, weird surname. Um, so yeah, you'll certainly find me on that. Um, as part of the book promotion, you will also find me on Facebook and Instagram. Um, YouTube is to come. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm sort of looking at expanding all those, all those different, different areas. But yeah, LinkedIn is is the main one because clearly you can um, message me on that, and it will have links to both my business website and more specifically for what we're talking about here the, the book website there's a separate there's a separate thing there currently in development on that is a sort of self audit a little diagnostic thing which people can take um so ask some questions it'll give you kind of a you know how do you score if you like on these on these various elements um and when we send that back you get a you will get it's still it's being being put together as we speak um you'll get a kind of not only your scores and sort of visual what that looks like uh, some some reflection questions on you know, what what can you do about it because you know, that's that's the whole point um so yeah i guess they're the, the, the best ways to best ways to uh, to contact me they're all in the back of the book which hopefully people will buy <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> come, come september when it's launched um yeah, if, you, if you're on any of those platforms, hopefully you'll see the fact that it's uh, that it's been launched. Because I am, I'm going to ramp stuff up a little bit. So good for you, man. No. Know, knowing what I'm like, I'll have given most of the stuff in the book away by the time we come to launch it. So just you know, connect with my LinkedIn. You've effectively read it. <laughs> not <laughs> so, at all. Not at all. I think uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic book. I think um, it, it. I can see uh, how much of an evolution it is from sort of previous previous types of selling and how. Oh, it's absolutely a, a great solution. And I'd recommend anyone listening to follow Fred on LinkedIn because it lightens up my day seeing his sarcastic posts where there's just a total disdain for the general atrocity that is LinkedIn. And yeah, I'm going to call it out because there is some atrocious stuff on LinkedIn of self-promotion and what have you. And uh, if there's anyone that's anti-LinkedIn, Fred's your man. Oh, that's got me banned from that. Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm trying to control myself a little bit, but sometimes I just do get frustrated with, with stuff on there and the amount of daftness. But there is some good. There is some good stuff as well. That's absolutely, nice. absolutely. Yeah. No, I, sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to tarnish your label, you there, Fred. Apologies. <laughs> but I, I did. I did want to encourage people because I think no, it's, no, it's, you're well worth a follow, mate. They'll, 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 they'll probably see that. <laughs> the little moments you're referring to i don't think i'll be able to cut them out completely <laughs> absolutely brilliant right with that thank you very much for joining me fred um you've been absolutely fantastic and uh, i really look forward to reading your book when it comes out i'll certainly be buying a copy i may be buying a couple and i'll do a giveaway on the podcast and i'll get you to sign them as well for when you're simon cynic famous and uh, and i look forward to hearing your podcast when that comes out eventually too yeah that's also development so no look thank you thank you so much for inviting me i really enjoyed it it's a uh, it's good fun um Brilliant. and uh yeah i uh yeah definitely have you back onto mine <laughs> <laughs> he had to think about then didn't he listeners did you hear that little bit of hesitation <laughs> i look forward to joining him on his i'm gonna push it now uh no thanks for listening everyone uh, have catch fingers you crossed <laughs> <laughs> catch you uh catch everyone next week thanks for listening and uh and speak, see you again soon Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate your time. Please do follow me at Pete Rushmer on LinkedIn or on Facebook, follow Flagship Training UK and you can find us on YouTube too at Flagship UK.